another video purple political talk here and today we're going to be doing an update on my 2020 senate election map and now we have some primaries decided and we have um concrete um primaries and concrete general elections in some states and some things are constantly changing some races are becoming a lot closer than they used to be and honestly this map is changing quickly so let's get started by filling in our democratic safe states so as of right now our safe states have pretty much stayed the same um with very few exceptions um i, I with, on the side of the democrats i would say there are no exceptions i mean all the safe states are pretty much the same um I, I, while we filled in these um republican safe states i'm going to talk about a democratic race that i find super interesting no not montana um that's massachusetts so massachusetts is going to be safe for the democrats when it when, uh, when we get closer towards the general election because it's massachusetts is strongly being a democratic seat but the primary is going to be more interesting i feel like than the general election so we have joe kennedy the third he is um a descendant of the kennedys in massachusetts and that might really help him kind of get some votes and that name recognition really does help for a race like that so this map is going to be our starting off map you've seen that we've taken we haven't used alaska for our safe states that race is slowly turning into a more contested race and yeah so let's get started so right now i'm going to start by filling in our democratic likely states there is a couple so at this point in time um races like colorado new hampshire i would say minnesota at this point and I would even say even Michigan. These states are solidly Democratic for the Senate races. Colorado, you have a very popular governor going against a very unpopular senator. So, I mean, it's going to be very, very, uh, very interesting race to watch. Um, John Hickenlooper has been pretty popular. So, he's probably going to win there by around 5 to 10 points. Minnesota, Tina Smith, um, she was she's the current incumbent. She already won a special election. And considering the fact that she doesn't have a big um, Republican opponent, um, a notable Republican opponent, she's probably going to win there by around 5 to 10 points as well. Michigan is going to be a more interesting race to watch. You have John James. Um, I would say the future of the Republican Party um, going against Gary Peters. And Gary Peters is not popular, but he's not super unpopular either. So it's going to be, be an interesting dynamic to watch. Um, nonetheless, I think Gary Peters will probably win here again by five to seven points, maybe. And New Hampshire, the last seat in the likely column that I would say for the Democratic Party, um, we have Jean Shaheen, and she's extremely popular. And even though it's a swing seat, she's become so popular. She served as governor. She was she serves as senator, and all that name recognition and all that um, quote unquote support for her, she will do great. And I think the polls currently show it. So. Round, we're looking again, similar 10 to 15, probably like anywhere from the 5 to 15% range. So those are Democratic likely states. What about Republican likely states? There are a couple. So as of right now, I would say states like Alaska, states like Alabama, um, states like South Carolina, states like Kentucky, and I would say even the state of Georgia special election. At this point in time, I feel like these races will be going to the Republican Party by likely margin. So in Alaska, you have Al Gross, the Democratic challenger to incumbent Dan Sullivan. And I think what really matters in Alaska is the fact that there's a lot of third party vote and independent vote. If you put um, like both bases together, the Democratic and um, third party vote, you could beat the candidate in Alaska. And that's why we've seen many... We, we had an Alaska senator from the Democrat, Mark Begich. You had a lot of different... He, um, they had like a Democratic um, or quote-unquote independent governor for a long time. And for that reason, the state of Alaska is a state that should be looked at because it's a lot more liberal than people may think. In the state of Kentucky, you have Mitch McConnell. He is the leadership of the Republican Party in the United States Senate. He has a contested race, but considering that he's the Republican leader, the Republicans really are going to invest into his race more than they should be doing in other races, which might be a little bit more important. Nonetheless, I think he's going to win their by around anywhere from 5 to t five to 10 points. It's going to be close, but it's not going to be come down to the nail. Amy McGrath is a good candidate, and she does have a chance. 
nonetheless, um, it's probably going to be a little bit of a harder road for her to win. And in Alabama, we just had the primary decided. Um, I think it was like this this last week. Um, it was it was it, the primary was between Jeff Sessions, former senator, and income uh, and winner of the primary, I guess. Um, Tommy Tupperville, he was the former coach in the state of Alabama, and he was very popular amongst the states, so he won the primary for the Senate seat. He's facing off against Doug Jones. He's actually pretty popular for a Democrat in, in Alabama. So here's the thing where it comes to, to Doug Jones. If, if the candidate was flawed, which in 2017 when he ran, the candidate was flawed. Now, Tommy Tupperville is a good candidate, so... Tommy Tupperville is probably going to go on and win that Senate race, beat out Doug Jones around anywhere from 5 to 10 points. In Georgia, we have a special election. Realistically, this race should have, should have been closer. But I think it's the Democrats, they, they didn't run a stronger candidate um, in the state of Georgia's special election. They ran someone stronger, I would say, in the regular Senate election. Would that come back and bite them? Maybe, but... Who knows? So in this race, um, you have Raphael Warnock. He's the leading Democrat because this is going to be an interesting race where it's a young jungle primary. So if you guys don't know what a jungle primary is, um, it's, it's essentially on election day. All candidates that want to run, run. And the top two, if there's no majority, the top two voters, the two, two, top two candidates go on and they go to a runoff primary. Right now, I mean, the favorite to go for the Democrats is Raphael Warnock. Like I said, he's, I mean, that's somewhat known in the state, but I don't feel like he would have enough um, voter and he wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't sway a lot of the voters that are somewhat in the middle to flip to the Democrats. And on the other side of the um, aisle, we have a very somewhat contested primary, but it's looking like it's going to go to Doug Collins. Um, and right now, this seat, the, the, the Republican slot, it's sort of quote, quote unquote, is being contested by pretty much Doug Collins and the incumbent senator Kelly Loeffler. So that's going to come um, and we're going to see. This is probably going to go to a runoff, but I feel still that the Republican Party will probably win the race by around five points. And the last day, um, South Carolina, um, you have Jamie Harrison going against <clears throat> incumbent um, Lindsey Graham. So Lindsey Graham, again, he's a Mitch McConnell type of person. He's been in the Senate for somewhat a long time and he's become... <clears throat> Sorry about that. He's become part of the party leadership. He's kind of one of those senators that's kind of been up there. And honestly, Lindsey Graham is going to probably win here just because he has the support of the um, Republican leadership. And that really goes somewhere. If you're a popular senator um, amongst the establishment, that's going to get you places when it comes to funding, things like that. No, I mean, Jamie Harrison, and especially how the state's demographics are going, he has a chance at going, winning. Nonetheless, I feel like um, Lindsey Graham still has a 10 to f uh, even a 10 to 15 percent chance of victory. I mean, uh, percentage of victory. So those are Republican um, likely states. So what is the one big trend that we're seeing? Democrats are doing very extremely well, and the map really favors them. Right now, just filling off the likely states, Democrats do need to flip three different seats to take over the majority. And considering how this map is looking, I mean, it's definitely going to be favoring them. It won't be hard for the Democrats to win the Senate in 2020. It's just a thing of strategizing and looking at a way to win some races they might not have won before. And yeah, so those are our likely seats for the Republicans. And now we're going to look at our, um, our, like, our lean seats, actually, for the Democratic Party. At this point, I would say there's a couple. I would say the state of Arizona is looking like it's going to go by a lean margin for Mark Kelly. Martha McSally is not a, is super unpopular. Um, and realistically, Martha McSally doesn't have a chance at re-election, I would say. Um, Mark Kelly has consistent... Yeah, well, she does have a chance, but realistically, the chances, the odds are low. Um, Mark Kelly has consistently been leading her in the polls and the betting markets and all these different things by around 8 points, which... Considering like the, the the importance of these Senate elections, 
It's a lot. I mean, but I would say, I wouldn't say it would be all the eight points it's probably going to go by. I would say it would go anywhere from the five point range. So probably like five points would be ballpark where I see Mark Kelly doing. Um, he would probably win the race. But I think honestly, when it comes closer to election day, Martha McSally will be able to um, sway a couple voters. Nonetheless, I think it will still be a big victory um, for the Democrats um, in the state of Arizona. And honestly, I would say the same thing about in the state of North Carolina and then in the state of Maine. These races used to be in the um, in the tilt margin. And I think I, I'm very comfortable moving them up to the lean margin just because, first of all, the Republican candidates are doing atrociously fundraising, um, popularity, all these different things. The, the Republicans are incumbents. Um, and just thinking about it. So North Carolina, you have Tom Tillis. Um, he's not raising that much money. Cal Cunningham has outraised him. Yeah, the fact of the matter is, if you're an incumbent, you probably don't have to um, raise as much money. But it's still necessary, and Cal Cunningham has been outraising him. And I think that honestly, Cal Cunningham has a nice chance of winning here by around two to three points, which would be a nice victory for the Democrats. Again, this seat, especially in North Carolina. Every other cycle, so so you know, there, there's class of seats. So there's class one, there's class two, and there's class three. It's just like what groups of Senate seats get elected together. So this Senate seat, which I believe is class two, if I'm correct, um, it always ends up in North Carolina for the last couple of years. It always flips. So, um, for example, in, in 2008, it was held by a Republican and a Democrat won. Um, and then it went up for re-election in 2014. Um, the Repo- the Democrat lost, and it went to the current incumbent, Tom Tillis. And now I think that would actually happen again. Considering the fact that Cal Cunningham is able to fundraise so much more money than Tom Tillis, and all these different things, I honestly can see this flipping. And when it comes to the state of Maine, Maine is a more interesting state because, honestly, I feel anything can happen. Susan Collins is unpopular. That's just the facts. Now... Um, can she probably save her campaign if she distances herself to Trump? Maybe, but I don't think that's going to happen. Zara Gideon is a very strong candidate. And just considering how unpopular Suzanne Collins is, how she's been fundraising Sarah Gideon, and I think Sarah Gideon will probably win here by around the same margin, maybe as Arizona. But as of right now, it would be more cons- on the conservative side and put it on um in North Carolina, like North Carolina type margins. Um, because I don't want to put this race in overestimated, but I think it's probably going to go by three to five points. And this is very interesting because Susan Collins used to be re-elected with huge margins of victory. So those are Republic or Democratic lean states, rather. And let's go on to our Republican lean states. So I feel right now there's a couple. So that and I think there's actually only big, big like majorly two, Texas and Georgia. So these Senate seats, I feel honestly. Could even go to the likely column. But, I mean, I would kind of refrain from that. So, with Texas, you have John Cornyn. I mean, he's actually less unpopular, or actually more unpopular, rather, than Ted Cruz. And he's going against um, MJ Heger. So, she is a she's a type of Beto candidate. She's more on, like, moderate, leaning to the left candidate. And, honestly, she could probably put some, like, get Texas as close as 2018. Which, I mean, it's not going to be a big accomplishment considering how fast the state of Texas has been trending Democratic. I don't see the Senate seat um, flipping. And I will do a video later on on party individual Senate races. And I will also do a video on kind of best case scenarios in the Senate. But I would honestly feel like uh, this seat was probably going to go to John Cornyn by around two to three points. And that would be a comfortable margin now considering how close the state of Texas is. And in Georgia, you have John Ossoff going against incumbent David Perdue. And I think, honestly, that this seat is very, very contested. I think this seat is going to be more contested than the special election, which sounds ironic. Because usually when there's special elections, the special election is a lot closer. Um, I think John Ossoff is probably going to lose here anyways. But um, David Perdue is probably going to win by a slimmer margin, like two to three points. Um... Is it going to be, like, the best of margins? No, but for the Republicans, considering how fast they're losing grips on some of these states, they should be grateful for a three-point margin. So, I would honestly say that these Senate seats, um, especially in the Sun Belt, right now, they're not flipping. I would say these Senate seats will start to flip maybe 2024 or 2022 or maybe 2026. 
that is when I feel these Senate seats will start to flip. So those are our lean states for both parties. Let's go to our tilt states and just call the other um the rest of these states. So just out of the fact, if the Republicans swept the rest of these states, so Montana, Kansas, and Iowa, um, I would say that well, technically speaking, it would come down to a tied Senate. And I personally think, and the facts pretty much show everything's pointing at a Joe Biden victory. So technically speaking, as of today, um the Democrats would have the Senate um, because Joe Biden is leaning to his VP will break the tie. Now, if the Republicans re-won presidency, then the majority goes to the Republicans. So what do I think about these races? So these states, generally speaking, are a lot more conservative and a lot been trending a lot more Republican. So Montana, Kansas, um, Iowa, all of them have conservative bases. And I feel like, honestly, people are underestimating some of these races, especially Kansas and Montana. So, I'm going to go and fill them in um, from west to east. So, Montana, I feel, is going to go to Steve Bullock. So, here's the thing. This race is a popular incumbent governor that's retiring, um, or term, he's being term limited, going against a senator who is not that popular. Um, so, it's kind of incumbency against incumbency. So, at this point, it's just popularity. Steve Bullock has... Very big amounts of popularity in the state of um, Montana. And this state is not afraid to vote. Um, they don't vote down ballot. So, Steve Bullock, um, the same guy, he got um, elected pres- um, or Not president. Governor when D- Donald Trump, um, the same ballot that Donald Trump got elected president. So, he's been very popular with the people in Montana. And considering the fact that John Tester, who's less uh, less popular than Steve Bullock, was able to win his Senate race. Um, it was a little different scenario, but I would honestly feel comfortable calling this for the Democrats. And if things continue to develop in a Democrat's favor, we could see Steve Bullock winning here by around two to three points. It's also a fact that Steve Bullock has been out raising um, Steve Daines in this race. So right now, the Democrats would have the um, outright majority if the Republicans carry the other two seats, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think that Kansas would actually go to the Democrats. So at this point, I'm calling this race in the so column just because we don't know who the primary winner is going to be for the Republican Party. So I'm putting this in the tilt column more because of the uncertainty. Um, but um, in margin-wise, if it, it, it depends on two scenarios. First scenario is that um, Chris Kobach, he's favored to win the primary. Um, he has the support of a lot of the conservatives in Kansas. And if he wins the primary, the, the Democrats win this race by somewhat of a big margin considering how close the state is. Um, or how how far right the state is usually on presidential and other occasions. But I think Chris Kobach is just a flawed candidate. And if the Republicans in Kansas choose to run him, that would be the biggest and atrocious um, pick in the state of Kansas. I think, honestly, at this point in time, Democrats, they ran a pretty good candidate. They ran a moderate, even conservative-leaning Democrat in Dr. Barbara Bollier. And... Just thinking about it, if now the other scenario was that if the the other Republican nom- challenger won the primary, so if the other Republican wins the primary, it's going to be pretty much likely or safe for the Republicans. But I think honestly, Chris Kobach is probably going to win that primary, but that will make it go further to the left for the Democrats, which just gives them another Senate seat. And I think honestly, Democrats should take this opportunity. I would, I, I've always had this theory that Democrats should um, um, win the Congress big and then live the presidency for 2024. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the video, but um, let me just talk about Kansas, um, about Iowa, and we'll talk about that. So, Iowa, I personally feel that um, Theresa Greenfield, she is a good candidate, but she probably won't beat Johnny Ernst. The state of Iowa has had, it ha- has had many close races in the past couple of years, and just basing it off the fact that Juniors, she was leading in some of the latest polls. Um, Teresa Greenfield, she is a good candidate. She has a chance of flipping it, but I think Juniors will narrowly push it out. It's just the fact that there's a lot more conservatives and moderates in the state of Iowa than there are more Democratic voters. It can happen, and we've seen it in the past where um, Iowa has Democratic senators, Democratic governors, um, and Obama won here. But I think honestly, Joni Ernst is just she's unpopular with her base, um, with like other voters with like. But, I mean, with her race, she's super popular. So, I honestly see Joni Ernst pulling it out. So, back to what I was talking about. 
I think the Democrats should be focusing a lot more on the Senate than the presidential election. At this point, I mean, we could just invest a bunch of money into the three Midwest states and win the election. And generally speaking, it would be better for them to start, like, winning a lot of these Senate seats. If we focus a lot more money in places like Iowa, in places like Kentucky, Georgia, they could probably win these Senate seats, which will come handy. And it, it, it might be in the best interest of the Democrats to lose the presidency. So by the time they go in 2024, we have like super majorities in Senate and House, which allows them to do pretty much anything they want. So at this point in time, I feel like this is going to be the Senate map. 52 Democrats to 48 Republicans. This is oftenly changing. I mean, we have, we've seen states that have flipped um, or moved further into uh, other columns. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this race develops. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a huge thumbs up, like, and subscribe to turn on post and turn on post notifications so you get notified when I post my next video. I hope you enjoyed this video and goodbye.